Land Rover's Freelander 2 is the classiest compact 4x4 on the market. Class costs, of course, but with rivals you get what you don't pay for. Compromised off-road ability, lower residuals and the lack of that feeling a Freelander gives you of being at the helm of a Range Rover designed for the real world. In second generation form, the Freelander really had to step up a gear, and it has. The first generation car had been overtaken in most meaningful respects by Japanese rivals by the time it shuffled off the market in 2006, and a really groundbreaking replacement was called for. Most agree that the car in question has really moved the compact 4x4 sector forward, especially for buyers who genuinely care about off-road ability. But even if you don't, this car makes a strong case for itself, especially since its eco-friendly start-stop system makes it no pricier to run than an ordinary family estate. Being higher up than you would be in a normal car is great for driving, whether you're in an urban traffic jam or out on the dales. And sure enough, this car's commanding driving position is one reason why many people like it your perch offering you a commanding view out over the flat, square-edged bonnet. Now, all models share the same 2,179cc, 160 brake horsepower TD4 turbo diesel engine with um, start-stop technology to cut fuel in urban traffic. The full-time intelligent 4x4 setup is based around a sophisticated Haldex centre differential that uh, directs drive mainly to uh, the front wheels but it could also channel it rearwards as and when necessary. Uh, 60 from rest is 10.9 seconds away uh, en route to a top speed of 112 miles an hour but more importantly there's 400 newton meters of torque so pulling power should always be in plentiful supply. One of the most exciting uh, aspects of this car is Land Rover's decision to fit their excellent terrain response system that's standard on all but the entry level model. Now uh, this system enables you to select the kind of off-road conditions or the kind of on-road conditions that the car is experiencing via a rotary control knob in front of the gear lever. It's got four settings, normal for on-road conditions, or uh, snow, grass or gravel, or uh, mud or ruts, or sand. And uh, in either case, the car will then electronically work out how to uh, dole out the power and maximise the traction, turning it into a far more effective off-road tool. A nice touch is this uh, display panel in the centre of the dashboard showing the front wheel steering angle, which is really useful if you've become disorientated on a, a seriously muddy track. There's still no low-range transfer case which might scrub this car off the lists of people who want something that's really rough and ready. But it's still true to say that no other car in this class can get near to this one's off-road abilities. Ground clearance of 210 millimetres is one reason why this car can wade through over half a metre of water while the approach angle of 31 degrees, the breakover angle of 23 degrees and the departure angle of 34 degrees are all excellent. On top of that, the full-time intelligent four-wheel drive setup and the sophisticated Haldex centre differential have a whole host of clever systems for extricating you from a tricky spot. One example of which is the gradient release control system which is a development of the old hill descent control system for descending steep and slippery slopes. Although the shape is familiar, you get more Freelander for your money these days. Podgy Americans couldn't fit in the Mark I version, so this second generation car is uh, longer, taller and wider, with the wheels moved further out to each corner, freeing up a further 105 millimetres in the car's wheelbase. The result of all this is that rear seat accommodation is a whole lot better. Though knee room remains only adequate, it's a big improvement on early Freelander models and you could downsize to this car from a larger Discovery and not feel too hard done by. Now the result of the larger car is a heavier body shell of course, but the uh, parallel improvements in safety, refinement and quality is a transaction that I think most customers will be prepared to accept. Moving around to the boot, 
It's a pity that uh, the rear window glass here doesn't uh, lift up separately so you could put in small bags without having to lift the tailgate. But once you do, there's a decently sized loading bay here with between 755 litres and 1,670 litres, depending on the position of the split folded rear seats, which fold down really neatly. Uh, it's a long, flat loading bay and you've got a retractable loading blind. As I've suggested, class doesn't come cheaply, with list prices for this car lying roughly in the 21 to 33,000 pound bracket, significantly above what you'd pay for most rivals, although not as far above uh, as you might expect. Most models are no more than a couple of thousand pound more than a comparable and far less capable Toyota RAV4. All Freelanders get TD4 diesel power, but there is the option of either a six-speed manual or a six-speed automatic gearbox. Now, all variants get uh, these alloy wheels, uh, a CD player and air conditioning, but the entry-level version does without the excellent terrain response system that's really part of the appeal of owning this car, so budget to avoid it. All models get seven airbags, including a driver's knee airbag. One reason why this car scored the full five stars in Euro NCAT safety tests for passenger protection. Nice touch is uh, the fitment of a full-size spare wheel, an increasingly rare thing in a class of car whose tyres are at greater risk. The reasons for not liking a Freelander 2 have become harder to fathom since the introduction of the eco-friendly start-stop system that's standard on all models now and makes this car greener than many conventional family estates. There's also a regenerative braking function that captures uh, energy that would otherwise be lost under deceleration or when coasting. Now these systems are hardly unique, but they are still quite rare amongst 4x4s, the kind of sector of car that you'd have thought would need them most. Now in city jams or at the lights, the system cuts the engine automatically when the car's at a halt, the gear leaves are neutral and the clutch is raised. Depress the clutch and put it in gear again as the traffic moves off and the engine starts instantly. It's as simple as that. Now you can um, uh, disengage the whole ecosystem by the button on the dashboard here, but I can't imagine why you'd ever want to, especially since the air conditioning, information and stereo systems remain unaffected. Once you've got over the initial purchase price, uh, running costs are quite manageable on an ongoing basis thanks to extremely good residuals after three years of between 41 and 51% of your original purchase price. Uh, there'll be few grumbles about fuel economy either. Uh, the 42.2 miles to the gallon combined return is one of the best in the class and the uh, 68 litre tank gives you a decent touring range. Uh, emissions aren't quite as good as the class-leading uh, Honda CRV and Toyota RAV4 models, but there's not a lot in it, with 179 grams per kilometre of CO2 being the Freelander's return. Insurance, well, that uh, is between 11 and 13, and uh, parts and servicing for Land Rover models is slightly more competitive than you get with German brands. Spacious, clever, good-looking and built in the UK, this is one car the British nation can all get behind and be proud of. There's even a much-needed nod to eco-friendliness with the start-stop system. Alright, so there are elements of France, America and Sweden in this car's makeup, but it could only ever have been produced using homegrown talent. Just as it did when it was first launched in 1997, this Freelander continues to redefine what a compact 4x4 should be.